Hit the subscribe button or visit us at auau.auanet.org. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. And I'm sorry we're a minute or two late. We'll, we don't want to we don't want to jip anyone in the in the course here. Um, we can go ahead and get those for the first slides up. My name is Judd Mal. I'm a urologist at uh, Duke University, and uh, this is uh, Changing Face of Advanced Prostate Cancer. So we have a very distinguished faculty of uh, close friends and colleagues. Dr. Lawrence Karsh uh, and I have been actually doing this course now how many years? Nine. Nine this is our ninth year together. And uh, Dr. Karsh is in Denver. He is an uh, expert in clinical trials in advanced prostate cancer and is going to be given the talk on hormone-sensitive metastatic prostate cancer. Uh, Dr. Alicia Morgans uh, was, is not going to be here in person. Her son got uh, appendicitis and had to have emergency surgery yesterday. So, but bless her heart, she recorded her talk. And so we're going to have, she has about a 30 minute talk and she's going to do that uh, before the question and answer session. Uh, she's at Harvard, a medical oncologist. And then David Morris is our, is our newest uh, addition to our course. Uh, David um, is in the Nashville area. He's a very busy uh, a clinician and researcher in advanced prostate cancer. And he's going to do some, he's going to be our, our uh, case leader. We're going to, we want to make it an interactive and he's going to do some cases. Uh, I will not read the learning objectives. It's a fairly busy slide. I guess the key teaching point, this is uh, trying to make sure everyone is on the same, close to the same page, if that's possible, on management of advanced prostate cancer, focusing on M M1 hormone sensitive, a short talk on M0 castrate resistant, a talk on castrate resistant, and we're gonna to try to make it case-based and interactive. If you wanna scan this code right now, this will take you to the AUA app, and we're gonna, we have to do some pre-test questions. Uh, this course is also uh, being live streamed, and so there will be potentially some questions coming in from the um, remote audience on the, um, on the AUA 2023 app, if you have, have that on your phone. So let's make sure, then we'll go right into the cases. So this is pre-test ARS question one. According to the latest 2023 NCCN guidelines for newly diagnosed M1 hormone-sensitive prostate cancer, what is the correct statement regarding docetaxel chemotherapy use as part of triple therapy. One, docetaxel plus ADT is indicated in low volume metastatic disease. Two, docetaxel plus ADT is commonly combined with mitoxantrone. Three, docetaxel plus ADT is commonly combined with bicalutamide. And four, docetaxel plus ADT is commonly combined with darolutamide. So if you could put your uh, um, most appropriate answer, And you have, to, uh, you have to go in under polls, I believe. Okay, let's, uh, let's move on to the next, let's go to the next question or the next one here. Hmm. So uh, ARS question two, what is the true statement about management of M0 CRPC with either enzalutamide, apalutamide, or darolutamide. So again, we're in the M0 CRPC space. All three agents improve metastasis free survival and overall survival. None of the agents are approved for use with a patient with a seizure disorder. The most troubling side effect of all of these agents is a skin rash. And in phase three trials of Enza, APA, and Daro, M0 disease was uh, proven by a negative PSMA PET scan. So which one of those is the true statement? I'm oh, sorry. Did I click it too soon? When you do that, it does open up the, it opens up the questions for us when you're on the screen. Ah, so maybe the, the, the first question didn't take, did it? Okay, sorry. Okay, now, so we screwed up the first one, I'm sorry. 
Let's do the second one. Okay, we'll go on to the next one then. When considering treatments for metastatic CRPC, which statement is true? Pembrolizumab is FDA approved for treatment of patients with PALB2, CHECK2, and uh, CDK12 alterations. Common side effects of Olaparib are hair loss and hypertension. 177 lutetium PSMA 617 is FDA approved for patients with disease progression after treatment with docetaxel and an AR-targeted treatment. And radium-223 is only associated with pain relief but does not have a survival benefit in MCRPC. So now I'm going to click it, and that should allow you to answer the, answer the question. Okay, we'll go on. ARS question four, which statement is true regarding the multidisciplinary care of men with advanced prostate cancer? Radiation treatment to the primary tumor, prostate gland, is generally now indicated in patients with oligometastatic disease who are receiving ADT plus abiraterone. The presence of high microsatellite instability or mismatch repair defects via genetic testing predicts response to rucaparib. Lutetium-177 PSMA-617 therapy is based on PIRADS-4 and 5 lesions seen on a prostate MRI, and radium-223 is indicated with symptomatic bone metastasis and no visceral metastasis and concomitant use of abiraterone. Which one of those is the correct? Let's move it. Okay, we'll move to the last question. ARS question five, which statement is false regarding patients with molecular genetic alterations and uh, targeted treatment options for metastatic CRPC? NCCN recommends tumor testing for high microsatellite instability or mismatch repair and for homologous recombination repair gene mutations if not previously performed. NCCN recommends tumor mutational burden testing to determine eligibility for pembrolizumab. Olaparib is indicated in patients with deleterious or suspected deleterious germline or somatic homologous recombinant repair gene mutated MCRPC who have progressed following prior treatment with enzalutamide or abiraterone. And olaparib and rucaparib are PARP inhibitors uh, that have interchangeable use in metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. Which one of those is false? So thank you very much for answering those pre-test questions. Uh, as part of the uh, AUA, this, these courses, we have to, we'll, we, we, uh, we're supposed to answer, ask those again at the end, or you'll get an email if you signed up for this course to answer those questions to see, test your post-test activity. Uh, it now gives me great pleasure to turn the podium over to Dr. Karsh, who's going to update us on metastatic uh, hormone-sensitive disease. Larry. Thank you, Judd. And uh, I'd like to thank the AUA for uh, allowing me to uh, be here today. And I'd like to thank Judd 
for doing, uh, inviting me to do this program nine years ago. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, re <laughs> it's really been my honor and, and pleasure uh, to be up here doing it with you. I, uh, this is going to be my last year. And, uh, you know, I know that we're going to have a good replacement for next year. So, um, thank you. You're going to be hard to replace. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you, Judd, for that very kind word. So, um, these are my disclosures. <clears throat> now, I, I want to start by saying that the uh, uh, management of prostate cancer be has become very complex, and it's changing all the time. So that I think that we need a multidisciplinary approach, and that would be the thing that would uh, benefit our patients most. And this would uh, require the skills of all the primary teams, urology, radiation oncology, medical oncology, as well as primary care, nutritionists, physical therapy, and there are multi, uh, a myriad of other factors, uh, including the patient preference, clinical expertise, and availability. And this will uh, allow timing of transitions. Uh, we'll have those uh, between the medical oncologist and the urologist, urologist and medical oncologist, and there are some important resources that are uh, for patients, such as patient advocacy programs and uh, a lot of on online information. So this is the uh, prostate cancer landscape. It's the, uh, the disease state uh, model from the spectrum of localized disease all the way to death. Uh, my focus is going to be on uh, metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. And there are two ways to get there. Uh, one is that patients walk in the door with metastatic disease. They've never been treated before. Uh, and uh, the other is patients who recur, and that's de novo. Uh, the recurrent patients are those who have been treated previously uh, with either radiation or surgery, and they go on to progress. Uh, now, the... Uh, you know, we're, I, I think we're seeing more uh, patients in the de novo, uh, new patients these days. Uh, probably about 10 or 12 years ago, we were seeing about 5% of patients uh, with de novo disease. And now it's up to about 10. What do you guys think about that? I mean, there's no question uh, COVID has had an impact. And um, we are seeing more metastatic disease, sadly. Um, I think the shortage of healthcare providers is affecting it as well. I mean, we can't... You know, I think a lot of places are under stress to get patients in in a timely fashion. Patients don't get in a timely fashion. Sometimes they give up and don't come to the doctor. So it's it's definitely a, a, a more of an issue. I, I totally agree. I mean, it seems like about every week I see one or two of those patients referred in from my partners. So, so do you think the uh, PSA testing is catching up with us now? Where that uh, you know the uh, recommendation from a D now up to a C, is that catching up with us? I think there was a lot of damage from the D. I mean, that you know, we had a period of, what, eight years where no one did, they didn't, primary care doctors were not PSA screening. And the other thing that we've seen, even though I know it's extremely controversial about a digital rectal exam, we have a whole generation of primary care physicians who don't know how to do a rectal exam, so they can't, you know, they can't um, contextualize a, a elevated PSA, but that's a whole nother topic, so. <laughs> okay, so uh, moving on, uh, you know, uh, this is the uh, Z-State model that was uh, out there. I added intensification to ADT because that's now the standard of care, as well as ADT and intensification for non-metastatic CRPC, which Dr. Mall is going to uh, talk about. So these are the unmet needs in metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. It remains incurable and has poor clinical outcomes. Survival is related to the type of presentation, whether it's de novo or recurrent, location of mets, bones, viscera, and uh, to the extent of the disease. And intensification of, uh, uh, with um, systemic treatment improves overall survival. And despite level one evidence for improved overall survival, uh, the adoption of treatment intensification has been poor. Genetic, genetic testing is underutilized in prostate cancer. And there exists racial disparities uh, in the utilization of uh, therapies, as well as we need better education for providers, patients, and caregivers. And so we need some better strategies 
um, to, uh, to meet these unmet needs. So how do we define metastatic castration-sensitive prostate cancer? Well, it's metastatic disease in patients who have not progressed on ADT. They may have been on ADT for biochemical recurrence and stopped, um, or they have never started ADT. So that's metastatic castration-sensitive prostate cancer. But in the literature, you're going to see different terms for the same disease state. Metastatic hormone-sensitive, metastatic castration-naive, metastatic hormone naive, and metastatic non-castrate prostate cancer. So these are all gonna be interchangeable that you're gonna see in the literature. But regardless of which term is used, these patients have metastatic prostate cancer and have not yet developed castration resistance. So there aren't too many paper, uh, publications out there that are still mm -hmm. uh, uh, referred to 80 years later uh, and uh, that are still relevant. And this was the seminal paper by Charles Hutkin, uh, Huggins et al. Uh, about, uh, uh, that really changed um, the uh, metastatic uh, uh, hormone-sensitive prostate cancer uh, landscape. And so we have, uh, now we have uh, metastatic um, hormone sensitive prostate cancer. The standard treatment has been ADT alone, monotherapy. But now we have this new era of intensification which started with, uh, uh, it started in, in 2015 uh, with first with docetaxel, then abiraterone, apalutamide, enzalutamide, and then more recently, uh, daralutamide. So uh, there were two Nobel Prize winners in uh, uh, prostate cancer, both for ADT, Charles Huggins in 1966 uh, for his discovery, and then Andrew Shalley for his discovery of peptide sequences in the hypothalamus that led to the, the development of GnRH uh, analogs. So from 1940s, until 1985, surgical castration was the main way of doing ADT. Uh, and now, uh, in 1985, we had our first injectable analog, which is luprolide. And then, uh, in 2008, we had our first injectable antagonist, which is Degarelix. So there are lots of stories in between uh, that period of time, but we don't have uh, an, enough time to go through them all. So what is the latest in ADT? Well, Relagolix, uh, the first oral antagonist, has been approved based on the HERO trial, and uh, it met its primary and secondary endpoints, sustained castration with non-inferiority to luprolide. Also, uh, it uh, had some other secondary endpoints, and it was a quicker recovery uh, of testosterone after uh, it was discontinued. And there was a 54% reduction in the risk of major adverse cardiovascular events. Now, this was a pre-specified safety analysis. It wasn't a prospective uh, efficacy endpoint, and the results were not adjudicated. So for this reason, the FDA did not include it in the trial, and we really need to interpret this uh, uh, with caution in this context. Um, so, uh, you know, there, the, uh, there's been a lot of controversy about uh, MACE events uh, and whether or not agonists or antagonists uh, uh, are more prone to, to, to getting MACE events. And so there's been a lot of controversy about this. There's a bunch of pool trials and retrospective trials uh, that showed that the uh, agonist uh, uh, that the antagonist uh, probably had less MACE events the, than the agonist. Um, but uh, these were really uh, never adjudicated trials. They were not prospective. And so uh, there is an ongoing tri uh, trial that's being launched right now to look at this. Uh, and it is uh, comparing relagolix to uh, luprolide and it's going to be adjudicated. Uh, there was one trial out there that did have a perspective comparison. It was a pronounced trial, and it compared luprolide to uh, dagger relics, the antagonist, and uh, it didn't show any difference in major uh, adverse cardiovascular events. And um, there were limitations to that trial. 
And one was that it was, uh, you know, and it showed no difference, but one limitation was that they planned to enroll 900 patients because of poor accrual. There were only about 500 patients, and uh, there weren't enough events uh, to show a difference between the agonist and the antagonist. So, uh, as I said, there's going to be a new uh, study launch to, uh, to answer that question with relagolix and Luprolide. So, Intensified upfront prostate cancer treatment. Um, we know that earlier is better. And the question is, is triplet better than, than doublet and vice versa? So we're gonna try to present some data to shed some light on this. So this is a level one evidence for improved survival uh, in metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer. And you can see the whole list of studies. You've got your doublets at the top, triplet at the, the two bottom arisons in peace. And what you see here is a breakdown between a low volume, high volume, low risk, high risk, and recurrent uh, versus de novo. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the uh, decision making for this is complex, but it's ultimately going to depend on uh, your experience with these agents and your, uh, if you have a multidisciplinary clinic uh, or a team, it's uh, going to depend on that. But uh, more importantly, it's going to depend on that patient sitting in front of you to try to make that decision. So are there differences between de novo and progressive or recurrent disease? Um, there uh, is uh, uh, not a lot of high science out there, uh, but uh, there, there's an intrinsic belief that patients who have de novo disease have more aggressive, uh, more aggressive biology. And this is one study, it was done in 2017. As I, again, as I said, it's not a lot of high science, but it's data to suggest that patients with de novo uh, metastatic disease uh, do worse. Can I just make a comment? I think this is really important because if, you know, when you have that patient sitting in front of you who has de novo metastatic disease, they're certainly the ones that you really want to be aggressive with to try to uh, you know, affect this curve. Um, and the challenge is, uh, and I, you probably have a slide, is uh, what, 40% of patients in the United States aren't getting any of this stuff still. Right. Yeah. Right. And so, I'll show you a slide on yeah. that. So, um, Let's, uh, let's uh, review the characteristics of enrolled patients in charted latitude and stampede. In, chart two, in charted, it was a volume definition. So uh, high volume meant presence of visceral metastases with four or more bone lesions, uh, with one beyond the axial skeleton or vertebral bodies and pelvis. And the uh, alternative uh, was uh, low volume. In latitude, a little different. It was a... Um, they combined a pathologic definition with a uh, volume definition to come up with a risk definition. So you had required at least two of the three prognostic features, Gleason score eight or greater, greater than or equal to three bone lesions, measurable visceral mets, uh, and it's and not uh, terribly different than uh, the high volume groove of charted. Stampede was different. It was newly diagnosed metastatic or node positive or high risk localized advanced disease with at least two of these three features, T3-4, Gleason 8 through 10, or PSA of, of greater than 40. So charted included M0, I mean, uh, Stampede included M0 patients, whereas charted in latitude did not. So, the intensification revolution really begins uh, in 2015, and, uh, and it, uh, docetaxel was approved uh, for metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer in 2004 uh, based on the SWOG 99-16 and the TAX-327 trials, and there was about a two-month survival advantage. So based on uh, uh, charted and uh, docetaxel, uh, it was the first therapy to be approved in the intensification era. Again, remember, intensification is ADT uh, plus another agent. But it was the first to get approved 
uh, in this intensification era based on overall survival. And uh, it, there was a survival advantage of about 13.6 months, and this was confirmed some simultaneously by Stampede. So this led us to believe that hitting prostate cancer hard and early is critical to long-term control. Now, what they found was that uh, the high volume patients were the ones that benefited. The low volume patients, you can see the hazard ratio was one, and so it was really for the high volume patients. Now in charted, they did allow de novo and um, recurrent patients uh, in that trial. So the intensification continues with abiraterone, and so they're substituting abiraterone uh, for uh, docetaxel. Abiraterone was first approved in metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer in the Cougar uh, 301, which was post-docetaxel, uh, and then uh, in the Cougar 302, which is pre-docetaxel. And in latitude, upfront abiraterone increased uh, median survival uh, with a hazard ratio of 0 0.62, and this was also confirmed in the Stampede trial. And you can see the uh, hazard ratios here in the, in the uh, Kaplan-Meier curves. Um, the uh, increased AEs were really related to the abiraterone, like hypertension, hyperkalemia, and elevated LFTs. Uh, but you can see that the combination uh, was much better than ADT alone. And this intensification continued with uh, apalutamide. It, apalutamide was first approved in the Spartan trial in metastatic, a non-metastatic CRPC, showed a significant uh, metastasis-free survival of uh, two years and overall survival as well. And uh, using abiraterone up front uh, with uh, ADT improved survival by 35%. Uh, and in that trial, uh, they allowed uh, recurrent de novo and de novo patients, as well as um, uh, high volume and low volume patients. Docetaxel was allowed, but it was, uh, uh, there weren't enough numbers to really come up with a conclusion of whether or not triplet therapy um, uh, uh, had any benefit. And enzalutamide was next. Uh, so it was first approved uh, in the uh, metastatic CRPC pre and post docetaxel with the Affirm and Prevail trials. And uh, the Enzimet and Arches trials were the intensification trials so that upfront enzalutamide increased uh, overall survival with uh, uh, hazard ratios of uh, um, 0.63 and 0.66. And, uh, the Enzimet trial also, the control arm was ADT plus a first generation non-steroidal an, um, anti-androgen. Uh, and it also allowed docetaxel. Now they did do an analysis with docetaxel in the Enzimet trial, but it did not show a benefit with triplet therapy. The hazard ratio was greater than one. Uh, arches. Uh, also, uh, it, it was low volume, high volume, de novo, recurrent, and it showed a survival advantage. They allowed um, docetaxel in the study. About 18% of the patients had docetaxel. Uh, but again, it was, not, uh, it was not powered to show a difference. So when we look at uh, safety with these, it's uh, really no difference in AEs between apalutamide and the control arm or Titan uh, between enzalutamide uh, and, and enzalutamide and control in the ARCHES trial. So can triplet therapy further improve outcomes in, in metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer? So this was the PEACE-1 trial. It was the first one, and it was reported in uh, uh, 21. And uh, it was de novo patients, and they uh, were, were randomized into four different arms. Standard of care, uh, plus or standard of care plus abiraterone, standard of care plus radiation, or standard of care plus radiation and abiraterone. Now, this trial started in 2013 before the new standard of care uh, with uh, uh, docetaxel uh, was reported. And so the standard of care between 2013 and 2015 was uh, just ADT alone and not 
uh, docetaxel. After 2015, there were about another 800 patients that were enrolled where the standard of care was ADT and docetaxel uh, compared uh, to uh, the uh, triplet uh, with abiraterone. And the primary endpoints were RPFS and overall survival. And you can see that there was improved uh, RPFS uh, in the docetaxel plus uh, or minus the RT population. And when you looked at survival, in the, and these were all de novo patients, uh, you can see that there was improvement with the triplet over the, the doublet. Uh, the high volume uh, had a benefit, as you can see here, with a hazard ratio of 0.72. Low volume did not, and the confidence interval crossed one, and it was 1.38. So the Arison's trial, uh, I think in my opinion this was a cleaner trial because they started out right from the beginning with uh, uh, using ADT uh, and docetaxel, comparing it to ADT, docetaxel, and daralutamide. This uh, allowed high volume, low volume patients, recurrent de novo patients, uh, and uh, the primary endpoint was overall survival and it met its primary endpoint, including some of these uh, other important secondary endpoints. And based on this, daralutamide plus docetaxel and ADT was approved for metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer in August of 2022. And when you look at the AE profile between daralutamide uh, and the, uh, uh, the uh, docetaxel arm only, uh, and placebo, I mean, and ADT, you can see there's not a, a real big difference. So there was a subset analysis that was just reported by Maha Hussain at, uh, G, at uh, ASCO uh, GU, and uh, she looked at the, uh, they looked at the high volume, low volume group, high risk, low risk groups, uh, and they were defined by charted and, and, and latitude criteria. Uh, but you can see that the um, median was not reached in any of these uh, uh, graphs. And when it came to, and there was a benefit in high volume, high risk, and low risk. But you can see that there was not much of a, a difference in the low volume, uh, but it starts to break up and maybe we'll see something as, as time uh, goes on that there may be some maturity. Uh, but it did cross uh, the confidence interval of 1.3, so I don't know if that's going to turn out to be um, positive or not. But I showed you the added toxicity with daralutamide, and when you look at now docetaxel with, the, with or without um, the abiraterone, uh, you can see that there are similar AE profiles. Most of the AEs occurred uh, due to uh, abiraterone, hypertension, uh, LFT elevations, uh, and there were some due to uh, uh, the docetaxel neutropenia, febrile neutropenia. So there wasn't a lot of difference between those. So um, uh, it, it, and I, again, I want to uh, emphasize that there have been no trials comparing ADT um, plus docetaxel to ADT plus a novel hormone therapy. So we don't know if one's better than the other. There are a couple trials out there that are being conducted. Aranote is a European trial, and they are conducting, dar I mean, they are comparing daralutamide and ADT to docetaxel and ADT. We'll see what those results show. Uh, there is a trial that uh, is uh, going on in the United States, Arasec. They're looking at uh, daralutamide and ADT and comparing it to the treatment arm in the charted trial. So uh, they're going to be using that charted trial treatment arm to, to, as a comparison. So based on all this information, AUA guidelines recommends that in patients with metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer, clinicians should offer continued ADT therapy in combination with either ADT uh, uh, and abiraterone, apalutamide, enzalutamide, or chemotherapy. Now, this is the 2020 um, guideline. They just uh, uh, updated the guidelines on Friday. And what they added was in select patients with de novo metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer, clinicians should offer ADT in combination with docetaxel and either abiraterone. 
and they give that a A priority, which is their highest categorization. Uh, and they say that it can be added, uh, you can add darolutamide, but give it a B classification. So what do you think about that? You know, what do you guys think about that? Uh, it's a little surprising they gave it a B. Yeah. I, I, you know, I'm not sure what the, so I'm not on the committee, so I don't really know what their thinking was, honestly. What's your opinion? My opinion is I agree with the NCCN, which uh, gives them both a category yeah. one preferred in high volume patients. Mm -hmm. So, and that's what I'm going to show you here. So this is the NCCN uh, guidelines, is the latest, and you can see that for metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer, ADT with one of these next hormonal uh, agents is a preferred category one. Now it's interesting to see that ADT and docetaxel, uh, you know, what, as per the charted trial, is no longer a category one. They recommend that if you give ADT with docetaxel, that you should give it with one of these uh, agents, either abiraterone or darolutamide, and they recommend it for high volume um, uh, patients. Um, and uh, this last one you, you see here, well, ADT is, is uh, 2A, uh, and that's if the patients um, are not uh, well enough to uh, to be intensified or there's a cost consideration. Uh, but I want you to look at ADT plus uh, external beam radiation, the primary tumor for low metastatic uh, 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 burden. And that gets me in the segue of our statement, uh, guideline statement 16, in selected metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer patients with low-volume metastatic disease, clinicians may offer primary radiotherapy to the prostate in combination with ADT. They give it a C, um, and it's uh, based on this stampede um, uh, data, which showed that uh, uh, radiotherapy for low-volume disease improved survival in the low volume patients. So you see that there was no improvement with high volume. Um, and what do you think about that? <laughs> you know, I'm gonna open up, you know, the elephant in the room is PET scanning. And so I, we're, we're, a little, we're a little bit behind, but just a quick comment. Uh, all this data was on tr conventional imaging. And one of the biggest questions that comes up at our tumor board is, you know, if you have quote unquote high volume on a PET scan, but low volume on conventional imaging, um, how do you guys, it's a, that's a tough one. Or right? if we have conventional imaging that's, uh, that's negative and we get a PSMA and it's positive, are we gonna treat a patient for a low or high volume disease? Um, I know that we are. We're looking at that now and we're, you know, mm -hmm. um, because, uh, you know, a lot of these patients will fail because we didn't see. Uh, they, they will fail because we didn't see that they had this metastatic disease. David, do you feel the same yes, way? Yes, exact same. <laughs> okay. So this is uh, a slide by Dr. Morgans, and uh, she kind of breaks the factors contributing treatment decisions into four different categories. Uh, Cancer-related, the extent of the disease, novo, uh, de novo versus recurrent. Uh, and then the expertise of the clinicians and their comfort with the AE management uh, of these uh, therapies, uh, as well as uh, patient-related factors like life expectancy, comorbidity. So we have to look at all these different things when we're making these decisions. And then uh, treatment-related, the cost. Is there financial toxicity here? And the expected efficacy and uh, toxicities. So. This gets back to your question before, Judd. Why aren't we intensifying uh, treatment uh, of ADT per the ASTRO, AUA, SUO guidelines and the NCCN guidelines? And this is, uh, despite level one evidence for improved overall survival, the adoption of treatment has been poor. And you see on this pie chart, it's really uh, reported by Friedland uh, and uh, his associates in 2022 showing out of 621 patients uh, that, uh, and this involves 65 oncologists and 42 urologists, that over half the patients received only ADT treatment. And you know, this intensification era began in 2015, and this is what we're still seeing. And 
When you look at some real world evidence, um, again, I have the NCCN guidelines, which we just went through on the right side. But if you look at the Medicare population, 83.5% of patients, ADT alone or uh, ADT in a primary, uh, a first generation antiandrogen, with only 12% uh, percent of patients being treated with ADT and NHT. You look at uh, the VA, 78% are ADT alone or ADT and a, a, a first generation and androgen, anti-androgen. And the, the same thing when you look at some of these private groups, uh, Optum and Concert, you see that there's a low uptake of, uh, of uh, intensification. So what do you guys think about that? Why, I mean, how can we explain this? What, what are things that... So in our practice, um, you know, even at a quote unquote center of excellence, uh, we see financial toxicity with the oral agents. I, I'll, I try to give the patients a one-month free sample to get them started and then um, try to do specialty pharmacy, but there's dropout and the financial toxicity. Uh, and, and then a lot of the patients in my practice who need it the most are the lowest socioeconomic sector, and they fall through the cracks. And, and there's, I don't have an easy solution for that. I'd say it's the same in, in the private world that uh, financial concerns are probably issue number one, but I think there's a large proportion of urology care that happens outside large metro tertiary referral centers, and it is a challenge to get through the workday when there's not enough urologists to go around for patient care. And so these are the issues that there's a laggard mentality of uptake. And it's this takes work to start people on these medications. It's not, let me send you down to CVS and you'll pick up your Cipro. This is hand-holding and reaching out to grant foundations or going through the distributor to try to get free drug to patients. And so it's easy to give the ADT injection, but often hard to do the next step. And so the AUA has to work like the other bodies. And I just love the fact that the oncologist, as much as they would say, well, that's just horrible urologists doing this, but Dan George's data is an oncology-focused data set that shows the exact same numbers. So thankfully that's available. So we can say, no, no, it's not just us, it's everyone. Uh, but we all need to do better. I, just, you know, I'd be interested uh, in the audience. Uh, how many people do we have that are practicing outside the United States? Um, quite a few. Uh, I don't know if anyone wants to. Are these problems similar in other countries? I see someone shaking their head. So it's because you're in a system where you can get these drugs for free. Uh, does anybody have? similar problems in their country like we're facing with this in the United States. So, interesting. So Okay, so maybe we're not alone, huh? Well, maybe we are alone. It <laughs> looks looks like it looks like no one else has problems getting this except uh, no, because I, of our I, I, I healthcare system. Some, okay. Very interesting. Yeah. Okay. But someone should do a study. It would be interesting. This data is out. I would love to see some young person, you know, it doesn't have to be young, someone actually look at this data in their, in their country and present it next year at the AUA because if you have really high compliance, um, then that's, you have further, to teach us. That's, Tell that's, us that's, that's further <laughs> indictment of our healthcare system, yeah. right? Okay, so moving on, we're gonna look at uh, germline and uh, genetic testing. So guideline 13, uh, uh, says that in patients with metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer, regardless of age and family history, clinicians should offer genetic counseling and germline testing. Uh, the updated um, uh, guideline from the other day includes consider somatic testing as well. And when we look at the NCCN guidelines, uh, genetic testing, germline is uh, recommended in high risk, very high risk, uh, regional or metastatic prostate cancer, uh, family history, um, and um, as well as uh, uh, positive family history of prostate cancer, but all patients with metastatic uh, prostate cancer uh, should get uh, germline testing. Uh, somatic testing uh, is, uh, is also recommended uh, and you want to test for MSI high or DD or, uh, uh, DNA dis mismatch repair uh, because there is a treatment like uh, pembrolizumab. And uh, in my practice, uh, you know, it's important to get a, a good family history. And um, it's not just do you have prostate cancer, but is there 
uh, breast male or female breast, ovarian, or even pancreatic cancer. Uh, and so that's part of the history as well. And uh, we uh, recommend germline testing in my practice uh, because it informs the patient, it informs the family, uh, and we may have a, a clinical trial available. And if they are positive uh, at this phase, then they may qualify for a treatment like a PARP inhibitor when they develop metastatic castration uh, resistant prostate cancer. Do you uh, guys have any comments? How do you do it, David? Uh, I think that's, uh, if someone's de novo and they have recent tissue, we obtain somatic testing first and then do confirmatory germline for all the family counseling reasons. But it's, it's sometimes cheaper just to get somatic and that the test is negative, then you don't need to worry about getting germline testing. Um, that, that's in our, just our one shout out to cost savings that we can do in this mm -hmm, situation. Mm -hmm. Okay, Judd? I agree. Okay. Yeah. So what about bone health? Don't forget about that. Uh, we treat patients with vitamin D and calcium. Uh, recommend, uh, and it's uh, 2,000 units of vitamin D, and we, count, we have them take a 600 uh, milligram pill of calcium with 600 diet, uh, if they can, and exercise, smoke cessation, we look at fall risk. We have a DEXA scanner on our office, so we can do DEXA scans, but if you don't have that, you can do a FRAC score. It's online, it's very simple to do. Uh, and it's the Garvin frac score is the one that uh, comes to mind. And uh, anti-resorptives such as denosumab or bisphosphonates are recommended uh, uh, as needed. And NCCN uh, recommends uh, anti-resorptive therapy uh, for elevated fracture risk based on frac scores uh, in the castration sensitive setting. Uh, this is, uh, is looking at prevention of skeletal related events. Remember, we see that in metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer, uh, where we have the high dose denosumab or bisphosphonase that we use. But uh, what about in metastatic castration sensitive? This is probably the only study that's out there. It was in 2014 by uh, Matt Smith, and they showed there was no be benefit in uh, preventing skeletal related events in the metastatic castration. A sensitive setting. Um, and so we just use it if they have bone loss. We'll use the low dose denosumab or bisphosphonates. So, what's on the horizon for metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer? Capitello study uh, looking at P10 deficiency and an AKT inhibitor, uh, capavacertib. Uh, and uh, they have to be P have P10 loss uh, uh, confirmed by IHC testing. Uh, and the patients are going to get CAPI plus ADT and abiraterone versus placebo, ADT, abiraterone, primary endpoint, RPFS, you can see secondary endpoint overall survival. It's an ongoing trial. And this is Talapro-3, uh, and it's looking at talazoparib, enzalutamide uh, versus uh, placebo and enzalutamide. Uh, and these are in uh, uh, high and low volume patients, uh, de novo, uh, as well as um, recurrent patients, and the primary endpoint, RPFS, uh, and you can see the secondary endpoints, and this is an ongoing trial. And the amplitude trial is uh, looking at uh, niraparib, a PARP inhibitor, uh, with uh, abiraterone uh, and, and ADT, or uh, just Abby and uh, ADT, and uh, this is an ongoing trial, and you have to have uh, uh, germline testing, and you have to have either somatic or uh, or uh, germline uh, or inherited HRR mutations, and that's ongoing. Uh, this is a, another new trial, CDK4 uh, inhibitor, uh, and it's uh, abacyclamib. Uh, abemaciclib, uh, and it's a uh, CK46 uh, inhibitor, and it's added to abiraterone and, and uh, prednisone or uh, to uh, ADT um, and abiraterone. And so this is an ongoing trial. It's looking at de novo patients, uh, and it'll be interesting to see uh, the results, but it was just started. And then there's a PSMA addition study that's looking at moving P uh, lutetium up into the uh, hormone-sensitive space. 
uh, and this is an ongoing trial. They ha you have to have PSMA positive scans on gallium scans only. You can have as much as as little as one uh, metastatic uh, node lesion, but it's got to be greater than 1.5 centimeters uh, uh, out, uh, in the short axis outside of the pelvis. And uh, these patients will cross over if they have progression. Uh, and so that's an ongoing trial too. So Judd, when I look at this, uh, when I first started here, uh, when we first started uh, in 2015, uh, we talked about the Renaissance era of drug development for metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. We were looking at uh, studies like uh, the M0 study, Spartan, Aramis, and Prosper, uh, they were ongoing, as well as if you look at the bottom here uh, in the hormone-sensitive prostate cancer, all these trials that have come to fruition and have been approved uh, were just being looked at back in uh, 2015. Oh, so is earlier better? Uh, we know from all these trials that earlier is better, and uh, whether you use uh, triplet or doublet therapy, I remember I, I said that it's up to your experience uh, and also this patient sitting in front of you. These are the, uh, tr the trials that are in progress. Uh, we've had active surveillance and act uh, read out last year that didn't get a lot of traction. Uh, Proven just uh, uh, for CIPT just closed the uh, uh, data bat lock, and uh, now um, we've got Enzorad, Stampede Atlas, looking at intensification with radiation in localized disease. Proteus is looking at intensification uh, with apalutamide in patients who have high-risk localized uh, prostate cancer that are going to undergo a prostatectomy. And we now have biochemical recurrence, the Embark study, and I think uh, Judd's going to mention uh, something about mm -hmm. that uh, in your talk, and then uh, the Aristep looking at darolutamide in uh, biochemical recurrence. Larry, I just have to compliment you on this slide. You can tell by the audience they love this slide. There's all kinds of pictures, so this is a beautiful summary. Thank you. <laughs> And this is the summary. So ADT monotherapy is no longer the standard of care. Doublet or triplet treatment strategies are stratified by high or low volume. Docetaxel high, Abby high or low, apalutamide high or low, enzalutamide high or low, triplet therapy uh, with docetaxel and aberone high volume, docetaxel and darolutamide high volume. Consider radiation therapy to prostate in low volume disease. Genetic, uh, germline genetic testing is recommended for all patients with metastatic and high-risk localized prostate cancer. Bone health management should be obligatory. All cancer patients should be offered and consider a clinical trial if available. So thank you very much. I appreciate uh, your time. So I just want to mention one thing here. I was at a conference two weeks ago in Boston, and I saw this guy loitering and trying oh to impersonate God. a squirrel. And what you don't see is his long tail because he's looking straight at you, and he wants you to see what he loves most. And I don't know if you can all read that. I <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Larry. What a wonderful introduction. Uh, if you could just bring up the... So CSP1, case one, perfect there. We'll just run through one through one case on uh, hormone sensitive disease and, um, and like you guys to kind of comment and feedback. So we're trying, there we go. Um, so 66 year old males presenting uh, relatively high risk but not necessarily outside the realm of what we'd expect. Um, has his standard AUA NCC guideline supported imaging for a high risk patient bone scan with no uptake, CT with a moderately enlarged pelvic lymph node. I've got a picture of it here. So that's kind of getting to the borderline range, but it's certainly concerning enough. Uh, we discussed aggressive local therapy, possible uh, treatment to that nodal disease as a potential site of metastatic prostate cancer. Uh, kind of considering all those things with the addition, as you brought up today, for, for lower volume met disease, giving uh, radiotherapy to the primary as well, as well as a combination with ADT for two years, which would be kind of the standard. And so then you brought up the, the issue of PSMA PET and how it's changing our landscape. Well, unfortunately now here is his PET scan, which is obtained as part of his pre-radiotherapy. And you can see there in the bottom, you've got three nodes that light up. And then you see this anterior rib up on the upper right, and also this uh, fairly large spot within his spinal column on the left. Hmm. So unfortunately, this is now 
five lesions, um, and you know, with pelvic nodal disease and bony mets, I, certainly it's outside the realm of what we would typically call oligometastatic disease. So we reclassified him as metastatic CSPC with a limited metastatic burden. Uh, we did do treatment to the primary and to the two bony lesions, and, and along with the primary radiotherapy, he had radiation to his nodes as well. He was started on hormone therapy with, with Relugolix, um, so the oral ADT agent as was brought up earlier. So intensification, question I guess for you, Larry, at this point, would you, is this someone you would say, yes, you clearly fit within that MCSPC category, we should intensify? Yeah, I think he has a couple of bony mets. I think uh, definitely uh, he's a low volume. We consider a low volume might intensify him. So you have your choice of the different agents and you chose uh, Abiraterone. Yep. So did did the um, did the his PSA only drop to two point six, which is concerning? Uh, did that play help play into your decision point on intensifying therapy? Or I guess you would have done it anyway, but that's that's a bit of a red flag. Yes, and so the, it went from twelve to two point six with the initiation of ADT from an outside physician before the decisions were made to proceed with local therapy or not. Um, so it was certainly on the way down. It was not necessarily the nadir we okay, were expecting, okay. but the fact that it had gone down but not to zero then made us feel like intensification was more reasonable. So I think this clearly fits in this. It's a, a gray area with PSMA imaging these days, but this would be a nodal patient that you have the option to intensify if possible. So we're trying to move out of that 40 to 50% monotherapy group and get someone like this who's young at 66 and has uh, potential benefits from So, you know, David, it's, it's uh, interesting to see the SBRT. Now, you know, the data for that, um, it's not real strong yet, uh, and it's based on some trials that really looked at, uh, uh, based on some trials like Oriole and Stump, that really looked at ADT-free survival and just treating the Mets. And so I think it's interesting to see where we're going to be going with SBRT. And this was presented at a multidisciplinary tumor board, and, um, and that very thing comes up consistently. We're, we're <clears throat> confabulating uh, primary de novo disease, metachronous disease that's presenting later, which is how those um, multiple MDT trials were done on later development of METs that were then treated to kick the can down the road and prevent ADT use long term. We are incorporating them earlier without clear, it's kind of a data free zone on right. incorporating at this standpoint. But unfortunately, I think for younger patients, if we can do it without toxicity and it's covered by insurance, it's one of those things that we don't feel bad about offering. No, and I agree. We would manage it the same way just because earlier we think is better and, right. and maybe they will get a, 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 an advantage. So just this, so this gentleman had quote unquote triplet therapy with ADT, Abby, and radiation. Could you could you have given him quadruple therapy with adding the dose of taxol, or was that would that generally be contraindicated in your opinion because of his? who knows, his lower disease So burden. he has lower disease volume. So this but, person would not have been captured into those trials mm -hmm. for the triplet therapy with chemotherapy. So that's part of our reasoning for not adding docetaxel in this patient. Um, but I do think that it would be up for discussion. The whole point of doing radiotherapy to all sites of disease and the primary is the hope that this could be, in a small subset of cases, curative. And so at some point, we're, we're trying to limit long-term toxicity mm -hmm and by intensifying on the front end. So I do think there are some long-term concerns about docetaxel. And if we can avoid neuropathy without any real clear benefit, I do think it's worth it for these patients to try without chemotherapy. But so. I think the important point too is this is a multidisciplinary approach. Yes. You sit there and everybody, all the stakeholders are around the table uh, giving their- I didn't opinions. want to have my medical oncologist later say, how dare you, why did you not give docetaxel to this person on the front end? Yeah. And so they were very much involved in the decision. Yeah. So. Well, I think we'll probably go right back to out of this and turn okay. back over to Judd to start okay. again. Great. We can go. These are the uh, mouse slides. So I'm going to give I'm going to give a very focused. Hopefully, I'm going to limit this to about ten minutes on um, this is going to be uh, focused on M zero uh, CRPC. M0CRPC, these are my disclosures. So what are the key teaching points right off the top? We have these three 
agents that are approved since February of 2018. Uh, apalutamide got approved first in February of 2018, actually on Valentine's Day. Uh, most of these patients are in urology practices because most of the time it's the urology patients who have the biochemical recurrences and are being put on ADT. And again, I'm trying to make the point on this slide that we as urologists need to be involved in this. Hormone therapy is our tradition. Uh, we do not want to completely lose this disease to medical oncology, even though I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth. I'm all about multidisciplinary care, but urologists need to do, know how to do hormone therapy. Um, Dr. Karsh just talked about M1 disease. Uh, certainly, these agents are going to be more well-known to people uh, when they are treated with metastatic prostate cancer. So when you do occasionally have an M0 patient, you'll hopefully be more familiar with these oral agents. Um, they, the key point is they're all oral, they're safe, they extend metastasis-free survival on average by about two years, and they all increase overall survival. Two years of metastasis-free survival is clinically meaningful. It's potentially more, two more years where a patient would not have to switch providers, and um, most of the time the quality of life is good during those two or more years, and using these drugs is straightforward. Again, what's the definition? It's a rising PSA on continuous ADT with castrate T and no metastasis on standard imaging. All of these drugs were approved with standard imaging. We'll talk about PET scan in a minute. That's again the elephant in the room is whether you need, should, or have any business doing PET scans in these patients. Again, the three approved agents, apalutamide, enzalutamide, and darolutamide, just to cement the thought, this is a case, 73-year-old retired grocery chain executive, great health, presented about five years ago with uh, moderate volume, inter, uh, unfavorable intermediate risk disease, went through our Duke multidisciplinary clinic and elected surgery. Uh, sadly, or unfortunately, he was upgraded and upstaged to path T3B with seminal vesicle invasion in Gleason 9. At that time, we were still using adjuvant radiation in some selected patients, so he has, uh, um, received adjuvant plus six months of ADT. Then his PSA began to rise three years ago. At a PSA of five, he restarted ADT. His PSA declined, uh, but currently has a PSA of 2.8, castrate serum testosterone, restaging bone scan and CT were negative. Uh, his PS, I'm not, not on this slide, but his PSA doubling time was uh, about 10 months. Uh, currently, he's with metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer. And based on Spartan, Prosper, and Aramis, he would be eligible for one of these three agents. Uh, all of the studies were published in the New England Journal of Medicine, showing a survival benefit. Um, for the sake of time, I'm just going to mention that the trials were extremely similar in their design, and all of them had pretty much a, a, a almost identical inclusion criteria. Except one of the key differences, Aramis with darolutamide did allow patients to enter the trial with a um, history of seizure disorder. So that was the one difference because the darolutamide does not uh, cross the blood-brain barrier to the same degree as the other two agents, so those patients were allowed. And I'll just, the, the reason that's important is sometimes you'll see that on the in-service in exams or board exams. Uh, I noticed uh, Do Dr. Morris had on his no seizure disorder, but they might trick you up and say the guy had a seizure disorder and the case goes along and you're just not supposed to use apalutamide or enzalutamide and the patient has a seizure disorder. Again, all of them showed a metastasis-free and overall survival benefit. And as uh, Larry talked about in the previous talk, the adverse event or side effect profiles of these are, you know, they're all generally well tolerated and manageable side effects by urologists. You need to know what to expect and you need to understand the side effects, but none of these have side effects that would preclude a urologist being comfortable giving them. This just shows the overall survival comparison that was presented in 2020 at ASCO. Um, again, the key teaching point is all of them, uh, of, even though they were all FDA approved on metastasis-free survival, 
they all eventually showed an overall survival. So the discussion in 2023 is, you know, how do you identify these patients? Will this stage or disease continue to exist in the PET scan era? You know, probably not if you do a PET scan. Uh, how do you decide between apalutamide, enzalutamide, and darolutamide? And the only one, I mean, thing we can say for sure is if the patient has a seizure disorder or something that um, makes them more susceptible to a seizure, then you would be potentially better off using darolutamide. Other than that, there's no hard contraindications uh, for any of them. They're well tolerated. Um, they are expensive. They all require specialty pharmacy support. Again, I know we have quite a number of international attendees, but in the United States, what that means is you just can't send them to a regular pharmacy. You have to use a specialty pharmacy, which is comfortable getting approvals for these more expensive cancer agents. Now, PET scanning is changing things, not only for this, but for all aspects of prostate cancer. These, the slide shows the different agents that have been used. I highlighted PSMA PET, the gallium or F18 agent. These are now widely available in the United States and many parts of the world. And, you know, it's redefining things. This was a specific study done in non metastatic CRPC. 98% of patients had a PSMA PET positive disease when they were clinically staged as M0 CRPC. In other words, they had a negative bone scan, negative CT, and then they did a PET scan, and virtually all of them. So the question is, do you still stage them as M0 traditional CRPC, or do you stage them as M1 PET positive, which we don't even have a, a categorization of that yet. Um, so, you know, PET scan, here's what I would say, and we talked, uh, there was another course uh, yesterday that I was involved with with Axel Heidenreich from Germany and, um, who's a, and uh, another uh, physician who's a PET expert. And uh, the consensus in that course was PET scanning is not required before use of these oral agents unless the PET scan is going to specifically change something. Now remember, you might say, well, I want to get the PET scan because I want to radiate those, no those spots. I want to radiate that. Well, as my understanding, and I was going to ask uh, our panelists, I mean, PET scan or the, the SBRT is controversial in hormone sensitive disease. And so, um, David or Larry, uh, do, do you, are you aware of any data where you're dealing with castrate resistant disease where SBRT would make sense uh, that we know of? I'm not aware of any. The, no. the best trials were still with uh, BCR patients um, using PET scanning to identify micrometastatic disease. Uh, at least that was what STOMP was. And, um, and, and so nobody's really seen failure to AR axis therapy responding to focal radiotherapy. I, that has not been incorporated in many practices, except outside the area of palliative care. And there are some ongoing studies now, uh, Presto, Blur, uh, Akron studies are going to be looking at this, but there was the HORAD study right. that looked at metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer, five mets or less, and the uh, endpoint was survival, and it did not meet that. So again, the key, just the key message, just so everyone's on, on the same page, you know, SBRT to, you know, low volume metastatic disease, you know, remains controversial in in hormone sensitive disease, as Dr. Karsh talked about. Here, again, we're talking about castrate resistant disease, so the application of SBRT would even be more controversial. So if you hear someone say, well, I want to do a PET scan in this M0 because I want to add radiation, it's really, there's really no evidence that is that, that is going to make any difference at this point in time. Now, Finally, this was presented yesterday. How many people in the room were in the plenary when the Embark paper was presented? So, we participated in this at Duke. I'm a little, I, I love the results. I'm a little bit bummed because I missed authorship by one patient. So, really? <laughs> don't you hate that? I missed authorship. I was bummed too. Yeah, me, we, so um, we, we enrolled quite a few patients. But anyway, it is what it is. Um, I'm happy about the, the study. So, this was in biochemical recurrence, three-arm trial. Um, LHRH alone, 
in biochemical recurrence, LHRH plus enzalutamide, or a third arm was monotherapy with enzalutamide. And I'm only showing you the top level results of metastasis-free survival presented by Neil Shore. Um, and there you see him in the middle. This was taken right from the front of the, the stage there. Um, that the combined therapy arm one, basically. So what we can say is based on Embark, combined androgen blockade with doublet therapy showed a sur uh, metastasis-free survival benefit in bio high-risk biochemical recurrence. Why am I showing this? Well, this could be a, also a game changer and further mess, or mess up this whole concept of M0. So theoretically in the future, any guy who goes on ADT is gonna go on doublet therapy right from the beginning. And then once they start to fail that, they're, there's, there is no other M0 CRPC or whatever it is, it's different than what these trials were done. So I just wanted to make that point. Now this is not FDA approved, this would currently be off label, uh, but I'm assuming that Pfizer will take this to the FDA and try to get FDA approval and then we'll have an additional consideration of combined androgen blockade when we pull the trigger for hormone therapy for biochemical recurrence. Judd, you know, the interesting thing about the Aristep trial, which is using darolutamide in high-risk biochemical recurrence, is that those patients have to have conventional imaging that's negative, but they have to have a PSMA scan that's positive really? to get into that study. And so it's very interesting, and they're going to be following with PSMA scans. So, so, so what do you call that stage? I mean, it's not, PS, it's not really PSA recurrence anymore. It's... We're going to have to come up with a new name for what is that stage. <laughs> so if anyone has a new name for that, uh, put it in the Please. chat. Um, so finally, the uh, key learning points is classically M0 or non-metastatic CRPC is a rising PSA on continuous ADT with castrate T and no METS on standard imaging. We talked about the three FDA approved agents that these are potent third generation oral non-steroidal anti-androgens. Uh, we talk the key side effects, fatigue, falls, risk of fracture, rare seizures, uh, uh, rash with, with uh, apalutamide, and also chemical hypothyroidism occasionally with apalutamide. There's no special monitoring required. So just the final pearls, all three, uh, three third generation oral anti-androgens, all improve metastasis free and overall survival, all cause some fatigue, falls, bone fracture, hypertension. Apalutamide, we have to, if you get a question on the boards, it is the one associated with some rash and hypothyroidism. Enzalutamide perhaps has slightly more fatigue and seizures, and darolutamide, less penetration of the blood brain barrier, less, uh, potentially less falls, fatigue, and fractures. Uh, you want to avoid enzalutamide or apalutamide in a patient with a seizure disorder. Thank you very much. So we'll move on to, thank you. So now what we're gonna do is, let's get the video up for Dr. Morgans, and uh, we have, uh, she's gonna do about a 30 minute video of her talk, and then we will end with some questions and, um, and another case, thanks. Hi everyone, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to present even though I had to head home for a family emergency. Um, thankfully all is well and I'm really pleased to talk with you today about advances in metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. These are my disclosures. And here's an outline of what we'll discuss, including those general principles that we need to consider in the back of our mind as we're caring for these patients in our everyday practices, as well as some recent therapeutic advances and some of the newest data and controversies that uh, are things that we should think about, uh, and we will end up with some conclusions. So to talk about general principles and MCRPC, these are things that I think, uh, again, need to be in the back of our mind and, and really integrated into our clinical decision making as we're seeing these patients in practice. The NCCN tries to help us put these uh, multiple therapies in context in their more recent updated guidelines. As you can see here, there are lists of multiple agents, which I think are very difficult to kind of keep in mind and keep track of for any individual patients. But 
this guideline really seeks to try to help us focus on what patients have received before as we're considering the appropriate list for where that particular individual needs to go in the future. So this slide and these guidelines don't uh, represent something that you need to kind of drill down in uh, right now on, on the screen, but to understand that each of these boxes represents prior therapies that a patient may have had before advancing to metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. We know that there are multiple avenues that patients can take to get to this disease state. So that's a heterogeneous prior treatment um, uh, algorithm that the patients may have experienced until they got here. For example, the upper left-hand corner of this slide represents patients who have not had prior docetaxel or prior hormonal therapy before they get to MCRPC. We know that in real-world data sets, approximately half of patients are still being treated with ADT alone in the metastatic hormone-sensitive setting, and so there will be a patient population that's relatively sizable getting to this upper left-hand corner box. In contrast, on the bottom right-hand corner, we can see the outline for patients who have received prior docetaxel and a prior novel hormonal therapy or androgen receptor signaling inhibitor. And so this population is gonna be very different. They may have received triplet therapy in the metastatic hormone sensitive setting, including ADT, docetaxel, and either abiraterone or darolutamide. And so their treatment choices are going to be different based on those prior exposures. And we can see how that, that shakes out here. So really just to emphasize that prior exposure is what gives us our opportunities in our next lines of therapy. And we really have to keep that top of mind. This is another way of thinking about it. This um, strategy was laid out to me by Dr. Allison Bertel many years ago when we were at a, a, a conference, uh, I think it was ESMO 2017 or 2018. And I just love the way she used different colors to represent different uh, mechanisms of action and how we can move from the left metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer to the right through each line of MCRPC, kind of trying to go to a different color box and, and keeping things straight that way is one way to think about it. This continues to evolve and I have to update it constantly to really pull in those newer therapies as they come in. So when we think about general principles, those clinical factors that are still key, the prior treatments are one of the most important things about understanding where we go next in the future. We also have to understand practical things like which, option should, which options are available in my practice location. Do I have the multidisciplinary team to give a radiopharmaceutical? Um, do I have the ability to actually deliver some of these therapies in my practice, in my area. We also have to think about the distribution of metastatic disease. Are there visceral metastases? Are there bone-only metastases? Does the patient have symptomatic disease? As these nuances are also going to help direct us towards some treatment options and away from others. We have to know if a patient is going to be a candidate for chemotherapy. If they're up and getting around at least half of their day, chemotherapy might be helpful for them if it's clinically appropriate. Whereas if they have a poor performance status and are sleeping most of the day or really debilitated, chemotherapy can shorten their life expectancy and cause more harm than good. We have to know if the patient is actually evolving some treatment-induced small cell or neuroendocrine differentiation when they get to metastatic CRPC, because this type of histology is going to be treated differently, perhaps, particularly patients who have overt small cell histology. They will get a, a platinum doublet combination chemotherapy if they're chemo fit, but they will not go down the routine path of MCRPC treatment. We have to understand if there are targeted, targetable DNA repair defect mutations, or if the tumor is MSI high, and actually understand, do we check for these things? And if we haven't, we need to get that going as well. And understanding clinical trial options always allows us to think in our most broad sense about all of the opportunities for our patients. The reason I always emphasize switching mechanism of action is because of things like this study, which demonstrated that um, resistance mechanisms can actually be spread through metastasis to metastasis seeding, as well as being seeded from the primary prostate if it is still intact. And th these resistance patterns often occur within that similar geographic proximity, and they show this interclonal cooperativity that really suggests that they're sending these mutational uh, resistance patterns back and forth to each other. Um, as you can see, these are areas of distant metastases that seem to have similar evolution of resistance patterns suggesting this sharing or cooperativity. Um, so what you've experienced before leads to resistance patterns that may make uh, treatments in the future um, really 
really not helpful to you. And, and this sharing is, is one of the ways that the, the cancer seems to make that happen. So novel mechanisms of action are really gonna be critical in our MCRPC patients. So in, along those lines, sequencing AR agents is usually minimally effective. This is a general principle that we hear and we talk about at meetings, but we don't necessarily incorporate it into our clinical practices. And so I'm saying it again, Sequencing AR targeted agent after AR targeted agent is usually going to give you minimal to no benefit. This has been demonstrated in multiple studies as we can see just a small example of these here. These are some phase two trials that really suggest that most patients will have uh, really not any, not even a meaningful PSA response, but no change in median overall survival or, or PFS with these sequencing of, of agents. And the CARD trial is one study that suggests that these sequencing is not going to be effective if we look at the control arm. To remind everyone, this is a patient population that has already been exposed to prior docetaxel and an AR uh, signaling inhibitor. Um, and what we know is that patients who had this MCRPC uh, diagnosis were randomized to receive either cabazitaxel or the alternate AR signaling inhibitor from the one that they'd received in a prior line. The control arm was the alternate AR signaling inhibitor, and here we can see with the arrow and the line down that that median progression-free survival is about 2.7 months in this trial, suggesting that the alternate AR signaling inhibitor was extremely ineffective. Um, only 14% of patients had a greater than 50% PSA response to that second AR targeted agent, and, and really, again, just confirming this is not a strategy that's going to be a winning one for the majority of our patients. Profound also included an MCRPC population. This population selected because they had HRR mutations or DNA repair defect mutations, and patients had already had disease progression on an AR signaling inhibitor. They could have had exposure to docetaxel as well. And they were randomized to receive Olaparib or that alternate uh, AR signaling inhibitor uh, in that uh, control arm here. And what we see again is that the control arm with the alternate AR signaling inhibitor had an extremely short radiographic progression-free survival of about three and a half months, and only 8% of patients in that AR signaling inhibitor arm had a 50% uh, or more PSA response. So just ineffective. We may have a patient here or there who needs to get this strategy because they are not going to be fit enough or have other options for therapy, and perhaps this is a last ditch effort to hold that disease in control. And for some of them, perhaps there can be some slight benefit, but it is generally very short-lived uh, and, and not really consistent with something that's gonna meaningfully change the trajectory of their disease. So the next general principle is something that I think gives us opportunities rather than being something that's limiting. And this is that we should incorporate genetic testing. It's standard of care in MCRPC. Our guidelines, including the updated AUA guidelines that just came out, really solidify this principle. And here we can see this, um, these are the guidelines uh, before they were updated just a couple of days ago, but they mentioned that in MCRPC, genetic testing should be offered to MCRPC patients. They also note that all metastatic hormone sensitive patients should be receiving germline genetic testing regardless of family history in the metastatic setting. So know that the guidelines say, regardless of family history, in your, if you have a metastatic patient, that patient should get germline genetic testing as well. Here the NCCN guidelines also state this, all metastatic patients, as well as patients with high risk and very high risk localized disease should get germline genetic testing diagnosed at any age, regardless of their age, regardless of their family history. And it also calls out that patients who are of Ashkenazi Jewish descent should also be tested. If germline testing has not been completed for those patients that you're seeing in clinic with MCRPC, do it. And if somatic testing has not been completed for metastatic CRPC patients, do it. And for somatic testing, this can be either tissue from the primary prostate, uh, if you have that available to you. It can be a metastatic site, which is ideal and preferred. It could even be a circulating tumor DNA liquid biopsy approach if you do not have tissue available. And here we know the guidelines also point out what are the genes we should be testing for, and the majority of commercially available tests seem to have these included in their panel, but just double check and make sure that the test you're sending 
has all of the things that you're looking for. That includes these DNA repair defect mutations, as well as testing for MSI high status and tumor mutational burden. And make sure that the genes you're testing for also include those Lynch syndrome mutation genes. So we're testing not just for PARP inhibitor uh, availability, but also for pembrolizumab, because those mismatch repair genetic mutations that are associated with Lynch syndrome will also give us the opportunity to use pembrolizumab for those patients. DNA repair defects, uh, genetic mutations are absolutely common in metastatic prostate cancer. They become increasingly common as we move out of the localized disease setting through metastatic hormone sensitive disease through MCRPC, such that the, the, um, these mutations are actually present in about 23% of patients with MCRPC. So as we move through that disease uh, state, through those disease states, we will see this increasingly frequently. Um, and this all initiated with some uh, evidence that in metastatic patients, those patients who had these germline genetic alterations were, were about 12% of the population. And that's why we do not actually require that patients have a family history or young age when they're diagnosed with prostate cancer, because that statistic of approximately 10% with germline genetic alterations was in an all comers metastatic population. And there was no association in that population with family history or young age of diagnosis. And this slide I think is so important as we as clinicians think about, do we do germline testing? Do we do somatic testing? In fact, we need to do both for this patient population because as we can see, particularly in the BRCA mutations, we will see these equally commonly in our somatic testing as in our germline testing. And if we did only one, we would miss about half of patients who may have opportunities with these targeted tests or these targeted treatments, I should say. Um, and, and these are the populations where we may see the most benefit. There is some difference between certain alterations like PALP-B2, more common in somatic testing than it is in germline testing, and actually seems to be quite sensitive to PARP inhibition. So it, it is important again for us to think about this and to get both of these testing uh, options. As we can see down at the bottom, MSH2 and 6, which is going to give us the opportunity to use pembrolizumab, more common again in somatic testing than germline testing, so do both of these tests. PARP inhibitors have been available now for a few years. The initial study that led to this approval was the profound study for Olaparib, and this is a phase three registration trial that included patients with MCRPC who had had progression of disease on a prior AIR targeted agent or signaling inhibitor. And what we know here is that patients could have been exposed to docetaxel, but they did not have to be exposed to prior docetaxel. Patients were split into two cohorts, cohort A, in which patients had BRCA1 or BRCA2 alterations or ATM alterations, or cohort B, which included uh, that they had alterations in any one of a number of other genetic um, loci that we can, we can look at in, in the approval slide that I have a little bit later. This includes things like CHECK2, PALB2, CDK12. Patients were randomized two to one, regardless of their cohort, and to receive Olaparib or the alternate AR targeted agent. And they were followed with a primary endpoint of radiographic progression-free survival and secondary endpoints that included overall survival. Here we can see that primary endpoint of radiographic progression-free survival. Um, and this is the overall population. We can see that Olaparib meaningfully improved for radiographic progression-free survival in the overall population, regardless of cohort or inclusive of both cohorts, I should say. Um, versus that alternate AR targeted agent. Here we see the hazard ratio of 0.49 that is highly statistically significant. When we look at overall survival, we can see that that was meaningfully prolonged statistically at least in patients who were in cohort A with a BRCA1, BRCA2 or ATM alteration. When we look at the overall population, this did not quite meet statistical significance for improvement, um, though you can see that there it does seem to be a numerical improvement uh, and you can see on the, on the, on the um, figure that there is a separation of curves for the overall population. TRAIN-2 is, is a phase two trial single arm study that investigated rucaparib for patients with MCRPC. They had to have one of a number of those HRR mutations that you can see there on the left, and they had to have a, a prior exposure to an AR signaling inhibitor as well as to docetaxel chemotherapy. Patients received rucaparib, as you can see, 600 milligrams twice a day in this single arm study that had a uh, primary endpoint here of uh, this overall response rate or objective response rate. And then other secondary endpoints included PSA responses. So here we can see the best change in baseline from a resist measurable disease criteria standpoint on the left 
and for PSA responses on the right, and this was only among patients with BRCA1 and BRCA2. So you can see that measurable responses occurred in a large number of these patients, BRCA1, BRCA2 on the left, and that there were some wonderful PSA responses on the right, again, BRCA1 and BRCA2 alteration patients only in this particular report. Um, we have also seen the Triton 3 study, which included patients who had MCRPC, no prior exposure to chemotherapy in the MCRPC space. And we can see here that these patients were randomized to receive either rucaparib or the physician's choice of docetaxel or a second generation androgen receptor signaling inhibitor, either abiraterone or enzalutamide. Um, and these patients were all selected as having BRCA or ATM alterations. They were followed for a primary endpoint of radiographic progression-free survival and had secondary endpoints, including overall survival. And this data was first reported um, at, at PCF and then again reported at ASCO by Dr. Bryce. We can see here that these patients could have had a crossover to recaprib as well. And here we see the radiographic progression-free survival, um, that we can see that rucaparib improved radiographic progression-free survival as compared to physician's choice of the AR targeting agent or docetaxel here in this setting. And here we see the BRCA and ATM subgroups with BRCA on the left and ATM on the right. So a little bit of a different response here among patients treated with the physician's choice and versus rucaparib and BRCA versus ATM, where we don't really see that difference uh, in terms of the alternate, that, that AR signaling inhibitor and docetaxel. And here we see the interim overall survival data that has not yet reached maturity. Um, and, and we can see that that suggests too that there's at least a trend towards improving overall survival here. So the currently approved uh, PARP inhibitors for prostate cancer include rucaparib and olaparib. You can see that rucaparib's approval is for BRCA1 and BRCA2 uh, uh, mutations in patients with MCRPC, and they have to have had prior exposure to an AR targeted agent and a taxane. Olaparib is approved for MCRPC patients who have one of any number of alterations that are listed at the bottom of the slide there, and they do not have to have prior exposure to docetaxel to be um, eligible for a lapper, but they do have to have a progression of disease on an AR signaling inhibitor. Pembrolizumab is also approved for MCRPC, and here we can see that uh, this is in really not for a majority of our patients, but for the approximately two to three percent of patients with prostate cancer who have MSI high status, have a TMB greater than 10, or who have those, um, these, those mismatch repair alterations in MSH2, MLH2 um, as well, MSH6, or either, even PMS2. So there are a number of these Lynch syndrome mutations that, that can make patients eligible for this that can be found in germline or somatic testing. On the right, we can see these pronounced responses to pembrolizumab, really suggesting just in a few patients in this particular study that we can have pronounced responses and we can have them in PSA as well as in radiographic um, progression. Lutetium PSMA 617, also called Plavicto, is a newly approved radiopharmaceutical also available in MCRPC. This was approved based on the VISION trial, which included patients with MCRPC who had had progression of disease on an AR signaling inhibitor as well as docetaxel, and they had to have PSMA PET positive disease on a PSMA PET scan. They were randomized to treatment with lutetium PSMA 617 plus best supportive or standard of care versus best supportive or standard of care. That could have been an alternate AR targeted agent. It could have been a pain medication, a steroid. There were a number of options available there um, for that best supportive or standard of care. And they were followed for a primary endpoint that was either overall survival or radiographic progression-free survival as a composite. Here we can see overall survival on the left and radiographic progression-free survival on the right. And we can see that use of lutetium PSMA 617 plus best standard of care was superior in both OS and RPFS versus best standard of care alone in this heavily pretreated patient population, again, selected for PSMA PET positive disease. The safety data suggested that cytopenias are probably going to be the one, the, the major thing that we need to monitor, as well as things like dry mouth um, and fatigue being other important safety issues um, that we really just need to support our patients through. But cytopenias do need to be things that um, cause us pause. We should be monitoring CBCs and, and really um, ensuring that patients have adequate cell um, counts before getting subsequent treatments. 
We also saw the therapy trial that investigated the use of lutetium PSMA 617 versus cabazitaxel in the MCRPC setting. This is a phase two trial that included patients who had had progression of disease on an AR signaling inhibitor, uh, who had actually, I should say, had progression of disease on docetaxel, and most had been exposed to an AR signaling inhibitor, but that was not a requirement of the study. Patients were randomized to treatment with lutetium PSMA 617 versus cabazitaxel, and they were followed for a primary endpoint here that was really a PSA-based endpoint, so PSA response of greater than 50%. And you can see that this was a little bit better in lutetium than it was with cabazitaxel. Um, and we can see those, those PSA 50 response rates there at the bottom, 37% versus 66%. So lutetium really um, in, uh, superior here in terms of the primary endpoint. Interestingly important, and importantly though, there was similar overall survival with lutetium PSMA 617 versus cabazitaxel in the therapy study. This is the three-year follow-up. So what we do know is that there is not a meaningful difference in terms of overall survival, at least in this phase two trial. I would say importantly, this is helpful to me as a clinician when I don't always have access to lutetium PSMA 617, and I know that cabazitaxel is also a very effective treatment for MCRPC. There's not a, a, a difference here if I have to give one before the other, at least in terms of overall survival for the population. So there have been some updates, some controversies that I want us all to be aware of. PARP inhibitors have been tested in combination, and we first heard about this about a year and a half ago. The PROPEL trial was one of the first reported MCRPC studies that looked at the combination of elaborib and abiraterone in first-line MCRPC. So these patients had had prior ADT. They could have had that six cycles of docetaxel for MHSPC, but no docetaxel, no abiraterone in the MCRPC setting. And patients were randomized here to receive uh, abiraterone plus elaborib versus abiraterone alone and followed for a primary endpoint of radiographic progression-free survival. Patients were all comers in this particular registration phase three, so they could have had alterations in DNA or pair defect uh, sites, but they did not have to. And they analyzed the results after, um, after testing for these things, but they did not pre-select and put patients in cohorts based on their mutational status in the front line or in the, in the um, it, prior to randomization, I should say. And here we have the primary radiographic progression-free survival uh, data demonstrating that the combination of abiraterone and olaparib was superior to abiraterone as a single agent here in this first-line MCRPC setting. And this is so important because abiraterone in this first-line MCRPC setting is a standard of care. We know it is effective. And so to be able to push that boundary for these patients, I think, is, is really important and interesting. Um, on the left is the investigator assessment. On the right is the blinded independent central review of radiographic progression-free survival, both showing that benefit to the combination. And here's the overall survival um, analysis. This was data cutoff three. This is the most recently reported information at uh, GUASCO this year. We can see that median OS was about seven months longer in the combination arm than in the single agent abiraterone arm, but that did not reach statistical significance. They are adding on an additional analysis that is not pre-specified in their protocol to give us some more data at a future time point. And here we can see the data broken down by patients who had HRR mutations versus those who did not have HRR mutations. As I said, these were tested um, actually by tissue and by ctDNA testing, um, and a majority of patients, about 97% of patients, did have uh, a mutation status that was defined as either having an HRR mutation or not, um, but importantly, that was not pre-specified and it was not something that was included uh, in their analysis prior to randomization to treatment. What we could see is those patients who had HRR mutations on the left, clearly having a hazard ratio demonstrating the benefit of the combination of Abby and Olaparib versus Abby alone. Hazard ratio here is 0 0.66, highly statistically significant. On the right in the non-HRR population, the hazard ratio here at 0 0.89. The most common adverse events were uh, really things around fatigue, GI effects, cytopenias, as we would expect from um, each of these drugs in isolation, abiraterone and olaparib. Um, and there was previously reported some higher rate of thromboembolic events with PE. Uh, these were identified on serial um, 
scans, but we're not clinically um, bringing patients to to attention of the investigators. It's what we understand, um, but something to be aware of that patients with prostate cancer certainly have thromboembolic events, and we should be aware of that as we're, we're treating patients. And there is this question of whether that might be more um, more common with the combination, though that did not appear to be the case, at least in the analysis presented by the group at this point. The magnitude study also looked at the combination of abiraterone with another agent in this first line MCRPC setting. This looked at though abiraterone plus neuroparib versus uh, abiraterone alone. And, and what we can see here, again, first line CRPC setting, these patients had uh, prior exposure uh, to ADT or perhaps ADT just taxol, but they did not have um, an extended exposure to abiraterone. So it was really first line MCRPC um, looking at quite a very potent control arm of abiraterone in the first line MCRPC setting. Importantly, all patients in the magnitude study underwent assessment for HRR status prior to inclusion, and then if they had HRR mutations, they were in the HRR positive biomarker um, cohort, as we can see in the green box here. If they did not have an HRR mutation, they were included in a separate cohort in this study. Both of these cohorts were randomized to the treatment uh, with uh, abiraterone with or without niraparib and were followed for a primary endpoint of radiographic progression-free survival. We can see here, and this is the HRR positive uh, cohort, that the combination of niraparib and abiraterone was superior in terms of radiographic progression-free survival versus abiraterone alone. And, and the results here, are, again, are the biomarker positive cohort because there was no statistically significant improvement in radiographic progression-free survival or progression-free survival by PSA in the combination arm um, versus the ABI alone arm for patients who did not have the HRR mutations. So that's really important to know. So really only the only cohort that seemed to benefit from the combination was the HRR biomarker positive cohort in the magnitude trial. This was even more pronounced among patients who had BRCA1 and 2 mutations, as you can see on the right-hand side of this slide. And here we can see with additional follow-up, this was more recently presented, radiographic progression-free survival held up as being uh, superior in patients receiving niraparib and abiraterone in combination versus those patients who received abiraterone alone. And here we can also see that we, they improved time to systematic progression in the BRCA subgroup as well. Uh, treatment emergent AEs were, as we would expect, again, cytopenias, um, some fatigue GI effects, but generally there's nothing um, unexpected seen in this particular study, uh, and the AEs that most frequently led to dose reductions were around the cytopenias. Telepro 2 was also presented recently. This is a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled uh, uh, study that really looked at the combination of talizoparib and enzalutamide here in this first-line MCRPC setting versus enzalutamide uh, and placebo. This is another all-comers population, um, so the HRR mutational status was not used to dictate which cohort patients went into. It was an all-comers population randomizing in first-line MCRPC um, to talizoparib enzalutamide versus enzalutamide alone. Um, patients could not have had um, extended prior exposure to abiraterone or progression on docetaxel, but they could have had some of that in um, the MCSPC setting, and you can see that was a small amount of patients in this population as well. And the primary endpoint here, radiographic progression-free survival, we can see in this all-comers uh, study, this is the blinded internal central review, talizoparib and enzalutamide with an improved radiographic progression-free survival versus enzalutamide alone. Hazard ratio here, 0 0.63, highly statistically significant. So a little more common, or a little more aligned with the Propel data here in this all-comers population. And here we can see RPFS by HRR status for those patients who had mutations on the left, that hazard ratio is, is even lower, 0 0.46. There was a population that did not have a known HRR status, uh, mutation status. This is a group that um, they categorized as unknown. So on the right, we see the HRR non-deficient population or the unknown population also appearing to benefit from the combination of talizoparib and enzalutamide versus enzalutamide alone. Hazard ratio here, 0.7. And here we can see the RPFS uh, by bonded internal central review in those HRR non-deficient um, a patient population, and here we can see that this is a 34% risk reduction in patients here. So really, hazard ratio of 0.66, favoring talizoparib and enzalutamide. 
The most common AEs, again, around cytopenias for the most part, nothing uh, unexpected here from each of these agents as single agents, uh, and anemia and thrombocytopenia and neutropenia being the things that I think are, are most important for us to keep in mind as clinicians as we're following these patients. So as we wrap all of this up, we can see that the treatment of men with MCRPC really is evolving rapidly. The general principles are still important and they hold true. Use of a second AR targeted agent after the first has failed is generally not gonna be effective, not in terms of prolonging time to next uh, therapy in a meaningful way, even if we have a short um, sort of stabilization of PSA, we probably will not have radiographic measurable disease response, and, and this is generally, for the most part, short-lived, not recommended. Germline and somatic genetic testing are standard of care in MCRPC. If it hasn't been done before, do it in your patients in MCRPC. Understand the breadth of the opportunities that may be, be available, including PARP inhibitors and pembrolizumab. Um, they can be, these, this genetic testing, of course, can identify those DNA repair defects that can show us whether these drug options may be possible. Lutetium PSMA 617 is an option after progression of disease on docetaxel and an AR targeted agent. Future studies that I didn't mention may move this drug more, uh, more proximally in our disease paradigm or treatment paradigm, so we may be able to use it before chemotherapy at some point in the relatively near future, or even in the MHSPC setting at some point in the future. We just need to see um, how those studies pan out. And PARP inhibitor combinations with AR targeted agents may be on the horizon. This is an area of active controversy and debate. Should we do this for an all comers population? Should we use these combinations only in patients with HRR mutations? And I think time will tell. We hopefully will learn soon. So at this point, uh, I thank you for your time uh, and really appreciate everyone's attendance and, and uh, attention. I'll send her a message and, and uh, say that we got, she got good, uh, uh, you know, a good uh, ovation afterwards. Um, I'd like to open it up for questions. We have a limited time. I'd like, hopefully, Dr. Morris would have time to present a second case, but I don't want to, you know, I want to leave time. Does anyone have any questions that they'd like to come to the podium and, and uh, ask? This is an opportunity. Uh, Open any open mic. Anything that uh, anybody has questions about. Okay. Well, I'm going to turn the podium over to to Dr. Mars to present the last case. Okay. So this may involve both of you, given your your talks, and then also what she just went over. All right, so here's, uh, this is a man presenting many years ago now, 2014, and you can see here, uh, fairly high risk, uh, young age, T3A on an MRI, and so he elected to have local therapy with uh, radiation and a planned uh, two years, 18 months to two years of ADT. Uh, about a year on therapy, he says, I can't take this anymore, so he stops his ADT. His nadir was very low, but now one year later, his PSA is slowly rising. So now here we are in 2016. Um, we have this rising PSA, obtain imaging. He has no METs identified. So back in 2016, this is a man who's got a PSA recurrence. Um, he's still castrated at this point, but his PSA is going up. Or at this stage, we don't even have the testosterone. Is this something you would do intermittent therapy? Is this somebody you place on continuous therapy? And obviously this has changed in 2023 with uh, new imaging availability but what would be your just comments in general for now? I would probably recommend a PSMA okay. at this point just to get him staged properly. So, and what was his, in, in November of 16, what was his, his PSA at that point was 2.9. Yes, so, so he, was, he was having a PSA, uh, technically a radiation failure um, as he had, had now recurrence meets the Phoenix criteria and is now a PSA failure after radius radiotherapy. And did you say his testosterone level? I don't have it. This was okay. before I was okay. uh, had this patient. So, well, at either that point, we basically said, but we don't have any Mets. You don't really want to be on ADT. You didn't want to be on ADT. Mm -hmm. So we'll just keep watching, which mm -hmm. should be typically our our guidelines for most of us. So now it's continued to rise. We're following radar guidelines, which give us suggestions of when to do imaging. And so we repeat our imaging. Uh, once again, conventional imaging, CT and bone scan, no METs. Uh, his PSA is doubling fairly quickly. And he says, all right, fine. Well, you can put me back on ADT. So with that, 
what would be something that you would consider at this stage? I mean, we're hoping that we're going to see a response, but obviously we're still kind of in this non-metastatic situation, hopefully hormone sensitive, and he does in fact respond for a period of time as PSA is now dropping from five down to a nadir 0.19. But then unfortunately this is the process we expect to see, the PSA is now rising. So it's, it's not even a long response, it's only a few months of uh, PSA response with the ADT restart. And now you can see this curve over the next few years, PSA doubling time six months, he's maintained castrate status, we have new imaging, a CT and a bone scan, once again, with no METs identified. So this is a little bit more current, 2020, but still yet not PSMA availability. But this was kind of our choose your adventure that we're now facing. And, and I just want to get you guys' comments on, on this kind of paradigm as you described, that conventional imaging may be negative in a lot of these patients, but PET imaging can show distant or even pelvic nodal recurrence um, and it's fairly rare to see a negative conventional negative PET imaging, but they still do happen. Um, PSA only disease clearly fits in that non-metastatic CRPC bucket. Mm -hmm. But what do you do with those other three where it's just pelvic nodes or distant METs, if it's high volume, low volume, any role for radiotherapy, you brought that up in the CRP set, CRP situation. But I just wanted your thoughts on that. I mean, I would in, the, you know, he has ne in the negative conventional imaging, uh, PET positive pelvis, or PET positive distant, I mean, he would, in my mind, he would qualify for enzalutamide, apalutamide, or darolutamide. Um, now, in the widespread situation, he would qualify for chemotherapy uh, as well. Um, but again, a PET scan was done. It's, it's unclear how that, how that would change anything. Okay. And that's typically in our practice, I think we try to follow according to conventional imaging is that's how the trials were enrolled. And certainly worldwide, that may be the best availability that some imaging centers have. But he's now started darolutamide as a non-metastatic CRPC um, and has a fairly good response for two years and then starts to develop a rising PSA and now has new bony lesions. So the next line of therapy, as Alicia has just gone over, AR th therapy agent to next line AR therapy agent, or is there something that you would rather try to switch a mechanism of action? What would be your your options to present to this man now with progressive metastatic CRPC first line therapy. Now, is this patient chemo fit? Is he... I, I assume, I mean, I present everything. I assume, mm. assume he's healthy enough that he could get whatever he wants and he's not necessarily very symptomatic, uh, but he, he's mildly symptomatic. So, I mean, I think if, if, if he had every option available, that giant box that she showed um, is kind of what are you walking through for that person and kind of this gets to that sort of what are the questions that you really want to get to in terms mm -hmm. of what is your next line of therapy so if you just want to give me an idea about that i mean i would you know at, at our institution he would be offered cipulusal t because i think it it would be if you're going to use that if you believe in it and if you feel that it makes sense you certainly want to do that when the disease burden is more minimal I don't know exactly what what is his current in 422. What is his current PSA? I maybe missed that. Oh, I don't know. Well, let's just say it's I mean, rising. So say it's under 20. So if it's under 20, then as you know, based on the quartile data, he would have the best chance of having a survival benefit. We know the non-randomized data from Raina McKay on cipulosal T in a Medicare population. That study showed that patients who got both AR-targeted therapy and cipulosal T had a better survival, although there's biases in that as far as selection bias. But again, my, I would make the argument for CIP-T at this point in time. Okay. Larry, any other and thoughts? I, I would agree. You know, it's uh, three cycles that, that are done in five weeks. And um, there is a survival advantage, and if he is ta uh, willing to do it and can, then I would. So for him, unfortunately, it was what if the bony pain. He was actually mm. starting to have some pain associated with these spots in his spine. Um, and so that may have you know, steered us away from an asymptomatic line of therapy like cipulosal T. Well, but he just, did complain of pain. So if just for the audience again the key teaching point if the pain was requiring narcotics he would not be eligible for CIP-T if the pain was managed by NSAIDs he would be a candidate now did he have um, 
was this amenable to ra palliative radiation, any it, of the bone mix? It would have been uh, amenable. He was interested in, symptom, in systemic therapy because of the rising PSA as much mm -hmm. as anything else. And so because of that bony pain and his previous air experience, he elected to move forward with alpha radium. Um, and, and afterwards had a typical PSA continues to rise. It's not an AR axis directed therapy, but his imaging is stable. So in this situation, in your hands, are you immediately switching to a third line of therapy or do you follow them until you see an imaging change? So he got six cycles of, he, um, he completed alpha six cycles of alpha radium. Uh, it's interesting. I had a patient like this in the last three months and very similar to this, interestingly, and we gave him radium first, and then he immediately went on to sip tea when he was uh, pain-free. And um, but again, I, it's some. You're either a believer in that or you're not. So okay. it's it's one of those things that. Uh, Larry, would you push to a different AR agent or or alternative therapy after one AR and then an alpha radium cycle? You could potentially do that. Um, I mean, remember the data going from one AR to the other, but he failed AR uh, with, um, with M0 disease, right? Uh, yes, or non-metastatic M0, yes. Yeah, so um, I would consider that. The other thing is, uh, PSA is higher, are you gonna treat the PSA only or are you just gonna wanna watch him? Okay. And how, is, how are his symptoms at this point? Well, he's, he has yet to make his decision, so I mean, it's oh. now been several months later, but I, I can't. Basically, I wanted to complete the case and thank you guys for including me so we can end on time and turn it over okay. to Judd for thank our kind you. of closing. Well, thanks very much. I really appreciate everyone attending. We had great attendance and thanks for all you guys to stick right to the end. I hope everyone has a fantastic AUA, remaining AUA. Um, if you enjoyed the course or got something out of it, please do the online evaluation. Um, we're hoping to uh, continue the series next year. Uh, as the field ever changes. Thanks again. Appreciate it. And thanks for, to Larry and David and Alicia, who wasn't with us. Thanks.